Hey everybody, Trinar2 here, and welcome back to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. We last left off, Miss Gina Lestrade here was found with an overcoat and a music disc that she drew out of the storage facility within this pawnbroker's. Shortly after, this uh, top-hatted gentleman here with the uh, sky blue eyes and blonde hair and dashing pose claimed that the items were his, he knew the passcode, or watchword rather, and the deposit date in order to prove that he should be the rightful owner of the items. He got the overcoat back, as you can see here, he's wearing it. He did get the disc back, but Miss Lestrade ripped it from his hand and gave it to us. Now we are just trying to decide who the disc truly belongs to. And we've enlisted the help of Mr. Sholmes here. We've called him over here to join the conversation and let's see where this goes. You have, in my eyes, a veritably encyclopedic array of curiosities about your person. Nevertheless, there are two immovable conclusions I have drawn. I beg your pardon? The first is this. The true reason for your visit in this prawn brokery today is something you have not yet revealed. And the second is this. A considerable crime is in contemplation, one you will orchestrate with intent to steal a vast sum of money. Well, Mr. Benedict, what say you to my deductions? How? He's turned as white as a hard-boiled egg. It would seem that once again, Mr. Sholmes has made a flawless deduction. Just who do you think you are, sir? Mr. Big Stuff. Ah yes, as I hope. That is precisely the pained expression I was looking for. I love the music in this game. So shall we begin? The time has come for yet another Herlock Sholmes' Logic and Reasoning Spectacular. The Great Deduction, the game is afoot. Topic one. Mystery Man's Aim. First of all, we must ask ourselves on what business you ventured into this pawn brokery today. You claim to have followed this pickpocket here, having had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. Ooh, what's in your hand? As revealed by that which you hold in your hand. Yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place is the staff recruitment flyer. Is it though? piece of paper in your hand is a staff wanted advertisement from this very shop. Yet even the most unobservant would soon realize that a man of your appearance has no need of such employ. In other words, there is some, some ulterior motive for your actions. His cane says AG. Okay. It definitely doesn't fit his name. cane which you unwittingly clutch to your person exhibits an uncontrovertible contradiction. Incontrovertible, sorry. What utter rot. I've, I've had this cane for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the missing feral? It's not the wrong letters? The end of any walking cane would be terminated with a metal feral to protect the wooden tip. And yet, detailed analysis shows the wooden tip of this stick to be utterly bare. Therefore, there's only one conclusion. The rod that you hold in your hand, which appears to be a walking cane, is in fact no cane at all. Exclamation point. You recoil, sir. Is something wrong? I, well, I... And in your recoiling, you inadvertently facilitate the answer of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth be behind this rod you bear? 
Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. From the moment I saw it, my suspicions were aroused. What walking cane demains such a stout handle? You, Stai. But of course, as I said, this is no walking cane. Is it a hammer? A croquet mallet? No, that rod... Is the broken handle of a shovel? What? Are you insane? And now having determined this undeniable truth, the conclusion is clear. Your true motive for coming here was to take employment at this establishment in order to excavate the ground beneath the premises? Oh, that is the most crazy one yet. What a calculated crime you have conceived, sir. A wickedly calculated crime. Okay. To tunnel underneath the pawnbrokery. Highly doubt that. Topic two, the great crime. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. For we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, intend to excavate the ground beneath this pawnbrokery with a broken shovel. What on earth do you propose I could expect to find there? Some long forgotten treasure, I suppose? Say for such a fanciful theory, what possible reason could I have to do as you say? Oh, but there is ample reason. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Oh, he's looking somewhere. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? Let us consider what would motivate a man to infiltrate a shop such as this and covertly dig beneath its floor. The answer is revealed by the council notice on the counter to which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. You sure it's not the gun? This letter gives notice of public works to be carried out in the local area. And according to the enclosed plan of the upcoming sewerage works, Beneath this shop runs a sewer that adjoins another, one that runs under the bank on the opposite side of the road. This madness has entered the sewers now, has it? By excavating the ground beneath our feet, you would gain access to the waterway that flows in very close proximity to the great vault of the financial institution opposite. What are you? In summary, sir, you devised a master plan to pull off an elaborate bank robbery by dint of underground tunnels. M master plan? Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. With what plunder did the thief hope to make off from the underground vault of the bank? Are you quite serious? Having consulted with Scotland Yard some days ago, I happen to know the answer. But naturally, the answer is no secret to you, is it, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see this picture postcard that tells us all we need to know? That's the one we saw inside of the carriage that Mr. McGilded was killed at. The one talking about the uh, tower they were going to build at the fair, the crystal tower. Postcard at a great exhibition? I'm afraid you've quite lost me. Currently in the final stages of preparation, the great exhibition will soon be underway. And the government has provided extra funds to complete its centerpiece, the Crystal Tower. Funds that currently set in the vault to the bank. On the other side of this road. Pardon? Yes, the considerable crime you have been contemplating... is the theft of which sits in the vault of that bank, the special reserve funds for the Great Exhibition. Of course, that is top secret police information, so keep it under your hat, please. You just told everyone. Conclusion, to steal the Great Exhibition's reserve funds.
Thus concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this pawnbroking puzzle. Does it now? I don't think it does. Um, Mr. Sholmes. Well, Mr. Narahoto. An impressively upbeat deduction for a detective wrecked with loneliness, would you not agree? Was it true what you said about the bank over the road and what it has in its vault? Indeed, though few know of its existence, this is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. Gregson told me in the strictest confidence. But you just announced it to everyone here rather loudly, in fact. Ah, and if it's such a big secret, how would Mr. Benedict have come to find out about it? There can be but one explanation for that. Clearly, it is because the man is a criminal. But what if he didn't know anything about the money in the vault? If he is a criminal, as you said, then buying a brand new shovel is surely to be the first thing he does now that you revealed the secret. Oh. Or if he doesn't, maybe Mr. Windebank will. He already has plenty of shovels here after all. Oh my life, I assure you I'm not so unscrupulous. Hmm, well, hopefully this has taught you a valuable lesson. Has it now? Sensitive information must be handled with the utmost of care. Yeah, it's called OPSEC. One can never be sure that someone privy to secrets won't disclose them. And once the word is out, it's out. Perhaps I'll think twice before confiding in you next time, Mr. Sholmes. An excellent idea, Mr. Narahodo. An excellent idea. Ha ha ha. Well then, Mr. Narahoto, you know what to do, I'm sure. Yes, let's listen to that great deduction again and see if we can massage it into shape. Very well then, let us start once more from the beginning. Of Herlock Sholmes's magnificent logic and reason and spectacular. Course correction, hold it, Mr. Sholmes. Topic one, mystery man's aim. First of all, we must ask ourselves what business you ventured into. into. Let me let me redo that. First of all, we must ask ourselves on what business you ventured to this pawnbrokery today. You claim to have followed this pickpocket here, having had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. As revealed by that which you hold in your hand, yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place is a staff recruitment flyer. I don't think that's the case. So by Mr. Sholmes' reasoning, Mr. Benedict came here in order to apply for a job so he could dig down through the floor. Yes, in an attempt to tunnel into the sewers to gain access to the money in the vault of the bank across the road. But he wouldn't get very far with a broken shovel, would he? No, I think it's fair to say his motives lie elsewhere. The question is where? What did what did bring Mr. Benedict here at this particular point in time? Alright, so maybe this. Scribbled writing. Let's look at it. Oh! Look at all the scribbled notes in the back of the flyer here. I don't believe it. What is it? Listen to what it says. Name, Gina Lestrade. Height, five foot two. Green cap, scruffy waistcoat, grubby white shirt, blue satchel, ragged. It's a detailed description of Miss Lestrade. I love the picture they've drawn there as well. Goodness, there's even a sketch of her hat and all. Although if he showed it to her, she'd fire that smoke grenade launcher in his face for sure. And look, the details of this shop have been written down here too. Windebank's Pawn Brokery, Baker Street. Redemption deadline, 15th April, which is today's date. Why would Mr. Benedict have all that information scrawled on the back of that piece of paper? All right, that's clearly what we're talking about. How do we present this? Take that! A hitting R, I guess. Yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place is the info about Miss Lestrade. 
Quite so, my dear fellow. It would appear that the writing and sketch on the reverse of the flyer pertain to the pickpocket, Miss Lestrade, and to Mr. Windebank's pawn brokery here. Ah. You originally told us that you had merely given chase after Miss Lestrade stole the redemption ticket from you. But that, sir, is a thinly veiled lie. It is the information on the back of the flyer that led you here today, by which I mean here to Windebank's Pawn Brokery and today the redemption deadline of that overcoat. So you waited outside for the young girl matching the description you have written down to arrive. Hmm. And you have gone to some lengths to hide the reason for your pursuit of Miss Lestrade. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. The cane which you unwittingly clutched to your person exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. What utter rot. I've, I've had this cane for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the missing feral. No, that's not the case. It's the, uh, it's the initials. Um, what's a feral? It's the metal cap commonly found on the end of a cane. Ah, the bit that makes the nice clacking sound on the pavement. Yes, exactly. And Mr. Sholmes is right. It appears to be missing on this cane. But it doesn't actually look broken, does it? No, it doesn't. Though the gentleman certainly did recoil when Mr. Sholmes identified the cane as suspicious. In other words, there's something secret about the cane that Mr. Benedict would rather we don't know. Well, I feel like... Can I look down? I feel like it's this the initialing. Let's look at it first before we present it. Look here, Miss Usado. There are some letters on the handle. Ah, yes. Those must be initials, I think. In the West, it's customary for people to engrave their belongings with the first letters of their names. So Herlock Sholmes would be HS, you mean. That's right. And the initials on this cane, obviously... Oh. AG. Why does it feel as though that's not quite right? Yeah, because it's, it's not. We're going to present it. Take that! Shatter the glass. Yes. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the initialing. A most astute observation, wouldn't you say, Mr. Egbert Benedict? We are led to believe, sir, that your initials are EB. Yet in most possessive manner you have in your grasp... A cane bearing the initials AG. An incontrovertible contradiction indeed, would you not agree? No, you're you're wrong. This cane isn't. As I said before, you'd had that cane for years. Grr. So don't try to tell us that you just borrowed it from a friend or found it in the park. In short, though you hold yourself to be a gentleman, you have withheld your true name something rip you recoil sir is something wrong all right well I and in your recoiling you inadvertently facilitate the answer to the next conundrum to present itself namely what is the truth behind this rod you bear even I don't know that off the top of my head is that something to I don't know Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle which you evidently would like to conceal is the key to understanding this riddle. But is it? Let's consider the bare bones of what's happened here. Miss Lestrade redeemed that fine looking overcoat. And now a mysterious man has appeared, introducing himself with a fake name, and claiming that the overcoat belongs to him. But we know that he actually identified Miss Lestrade from a written de description which suggests that everything else he's told us is untrue. So what we need to do here is somehow prove that the overcoat cannot possibly belong to him. Must be the rip that I just heard. Did he break the overcoat? Yeah, right here. That's it. Split scene. Let's present it. Take that! Well, 
The split scene which you evidently would like to conceal is the key to understanding this riddle you see. Ah. Yes, because the overcoat is rather obviously a poor fit. Having forced it over your broad shoulders, the seam is already breaking apart. My suspicions were aroused from the outset. When you so badly lied about your name and so boldly waylaid this pickpocket. Ark. This catalog of untruths has all been for one very specific purpose. To steal the article that the young girl redeemed from Mr. Windebank. Arg! But what really irks me is this. The considerable crime I initially imagined has been considerably curtailed. To abscond with a redeemed item. Solved. Now right, let's talk about topic two, the great crime. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. For we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, designed a wheeze to filch some tall tree article of pawnage? Designed a wheeze? To filch. So now you, the guy who claims to be a gentleman, is starting to use more slang. Have you forgotten that I redeemed the article in the proper manner using the watchword? Had I not been the one to deposit it in the first place, how could I possibly have known the relevant details? Ne sais pas? Oh, but the watchword can be discovered. As you're only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? Let us consider how one might come to learn a secret watchword relating to the pawn property of another. The method is revealed by the council notice on the counter. No, it's not. Maybe the scribbled notes over there? The direction of the deduction must change rather dramatically now, I think. Yes, no more talk of tunneling into the sewers. Which is a pity, because it all sounded rather exciting. Anyway, you can't deny that this mysterious gentleman did know the watchword. Yes, Professor. If you didn't know that word, Mr. Windebank would never allow you to redeem the article. Or looking at it another way, if you did know that word, Mr. Windebank would allow you to redeem the article whether it was yours or not. So the question is, could this gentleman have found the watchword out somehow? Well, of course he should. All right, so let's move this around a bit. Uh, right here. What is this? Notelet. Let's look at it. Look at this, Miss Usado. Ah, it appears to be a memo that Mr. Windebank has scribbled to himself. Let's see, what does it say? Oh, Professor. Mr. Windebank must make a note of the watchwords his customers give him right before their eyes. And an alarmingly clear script as well. Oh dear, I don't know where to look. Who knows what other secrets I might see. Yeah, so this is what we're going to present. Take that! The method is revealed by the notelet on the counter. To which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Yes, the broker here follows the same procedure whenever a customer comes to redeem an article. He asks the customer for the watchword and notes down the response uttered on a notelet he has to hand. Then he consults his ledger and confirms whether or not the watchword matches that of the article in question. I would expect nothing less of a diligent pawnbroker. But his diligence clearly has its disadvantages. What are you talking about? It is increasingly apparent that you were present in the shop before your accusation against Miss Lestrada. In all likelihood, you followed her inside and then observed her talking to Mr. Windebank. When the diligent broker made a note of the watchword, as is common practice, you observed him writing the word professor on the notelet beside the ledger. And that, sir, 
was the master plan you devised to steal the pond article from the young Miss Lestrada. Master plan? Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. Why would you go to such lengths to redeem that particular article from this pawnbroker? Are you quite serious? For an ill-fitting overcoat hardly seems to justify the effort, much less a worthless music box disc. But naturally, you had very good reason to make them yours, didn't you, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we... Yeah, not the picture postcard. The articles we're talking about are the overcoat and the music box disc that was in one of the pockets, which according to Mr. Windebank isn't even worth a penny. And yet this man went to such lengths to steal them. Why? I wonder if perhaps we already have the evidence we need to explain it, Mr. Narihoto? Could we? Really? I better have a thorough look through all the evidence we've collected so far. Well, I mean, we've collected this. It has to be this. It has to be the note. And the gilded note. See, this music box disc tells us all we need to see. You see, this music box disc tells us all that we need to know. What's that on the back? It reads, For me gilded. Arg. Ah, Mr. Magnus McGilded. The unfortunate philanthropist who perished in curious circumstances at the Old Bailey two months ago. A prominent man in London. Through his lone mongering demonstrated, though his lone mongering demonstrated a distinct lack of scruples. So you're an associate of his, are you? Or perhaps a subordinate? Mr. McGilded was a man of unusually small stature, in fact. He was precisely the right size for that overcoat you've squeezed yourself into. Ugh. Your true identity remains shrouded in mystery, Mr. Egbert Benedict. But the final conclusion here is crystal clear. The reason you came to this pawn brokery today... ...was to retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus McGilded. Tisks. Arg. to acquire an item deposited by Mr. McGilded. Deduction complete. Elementary. Well, well, Mr. Magnus McGilded. Not a name I expected to hear in these circumstances. Mr. Sholmes, I'm afraid there's something very troubling on my mind. Pray tell, Miss Usado. Well, according to what Mr. Windebank told us earlier, today was the final day on which the coat could have been redeemed, was it not? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Today would be precisely two months since it was first deposited. Was it deposited on the day of the trial? Well, today is 15th April, so two months ago today would have been 15th February, sir. That's right. It's all carefully recorded in my ledger. Deposited at 10.30 p.m., I see. What? But that suggests... Yes, 15th February. It's precisely the day on which the omnibus murder took place. And half past 10 in the evening is precisely the time at which the terrible events were unfolding. Suggestive is not the word, it would seem the matter is entirely beyond coincidence. You are, of course, at liberty to make whatever outlandish deductions you choose, however... Oh! Oh, he just, he just grabbed a gun and pointed at us. I must insist you hand over the music box disc now. 
Okay, I did not expect that. Not very gentlemanly of you. It would be a terrible shame for you to return to your native land in a box. Arg. What do I do? Woof. What do we do indeed? Well, I guess we'll find out next episode, won't we? Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my content, please consider a like, a comment, and or a subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.